Hey everybody, it is comic book review time again, and I have got a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful book for you today, The Ring of the Nibelung by P. Craig Russell. Now, P. Craig Russell is, to me, kind of a guy of legendary status. He's, his work is rooted in a certain classical sensibility that I want to compare with people like Arthur Rackham, almost, or even Alphonse... Uh, uh, Mucha. There's a, a timelessness to it. His work never has the feel of anything trendy, I guess. And you might think that's a bad thing, but no, no, trust me, that's, that's a good thing. Hip and trendy are curses that will cast your art into oblivion after you've shed this mortal coil. <laughs> So, was that, was that dramatic enough for you? Uh, good, because what we're going to talk about is a dramatic opera. So, yeah, deal with it. Anyway, Ring of the Nibelung, what, what, is, what is that? Uh, you've probably heard of it. Um, I hope you have. If not, the Ring of the Nibelung is it's an opera done by Richard Wagner, who is a German composer, was a German composer back in the late 1800s. He's a very complex and insanely brilliant, brilliant guy. He created just some of the most incredible, beautiful music uh, ever. It's just stunning. He has such a, uh, a huge, beautiful body of work, um, endless hours of enjoyment. So what Richard Wagner did for The Ring of the Nibelung is he reached back into Germanic and Norse folklore and myth and the poetic Eddas, and he reconstructed those stories to produce a new cohesive narrative. He kind of tightened them up. He sort of took these stories that were a little bit fragmented and he reconstructed them into something that he could kind of present as a cohesive story. So he made some tweaks and some edits and uh, added some of his own ideas here and there. And, um, and then the end result is this ring cycle, which is a four-part opera that clocks in at around 15 hours. So it's a, it's a staggeringly large piece of art. So right now you're thinking, oh, well, th this guy has impeccable taste. I'm just going to uh, quickly go to Amazon and order it and shut off this video. No, uh, keep listening because I'm not done yet. There, there's, there's a lot to talk about here. This material is not something that you can just kind of jump into. You can, but you're not going to get as much enjoyment as you could. So, before I get into the comic, uh, what's almost more important here, because of the, the density of the subject matter, is you almost need to build the scaffolding of your understanding of this material so that you can fully enjoy what's happening in the book and kind of fully... Uh, soak it in on the multiple levels that it kind of operates on. It's, it's a very loaded work and you, you, need to, uh, you need to arm yourself before you, you get into it. So what I wanted to do, um, I'm not only just recommending this book, but I have to recommend some other material along with it that I think is really complementary to it that you should check out uh, some of it before you you read this comic um, sort of as an introductory 101 uh, you know dipping your toe into the subject matter the first thing out of the gate uh, you're on YouTube right now so go check out a YouTube video called Norse Legends by Benjamin Samoas I think his name is or Saums I'm not sure just look up Norse Legends audiobook and you'll be able to find it I'll put a link in the description below maybe. Now, this is just a nice little fun audio audiobook based on the Norse legends. So if you're unfamiliar with Norse mythology, this is a, a really great uh, cursory uh, overview of some of the material and it will give you a broad brush understanding of this stuff. So I highly recommend that. Next up, still on YouTube, there's a guy by the name of Manly P. Hall, and he has a lecture that someone has uploaded to YouTube called On Norse Myth. And he goes into the Eddas and also into Wagner's opera, and you have to think of Manly P. Hall 
as a more kind of esoteric Joseph Campbell with one foot in the occult. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> but here in, in this lecture, you'll get, uh, he'll take that, that information that you got from the Norse legends and he'll dig in a little bit deeper and he'll start to kind of unravel some of the complexity contained within these stories. And you'll look at them now in a different way. You'll go, oh, it, on the surface it's about this, but underneath that there's so much more going on. And Manly P. Hall is really great at this. He's, uh, he's really good at this. The next uh, bit of material for you is the Poetic Edda, Stories of the Norse Gods and Heroes by Jackson Crawford. And what he does in his book is he takes the Eddas and he just breaks them down into plain English for you. And he makes your life a lot easier. And he makes the uh, he makes them a lot more fun because they're in plain English. You know, it, it's uh, they're a, a little more accessible. And he he does a bit of his own interpretations. And and it's just a really uh, it's a really easy read. But I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that in a good way. So his book is great. And also uh, again on YouTube, Jackson Crawford has a great YouTube channel. I I recommend you check that out. It's it's fantastic. And uh, the final thing that I'll recommend is a book called The Wisdom of the Ring by Roger Scruton. And I actually recommend that you read this book as you read the comic. So, yeah, start, start reading The Wisdom of the Ring. And then when it starts to, you know, get past the introduction and everything else, and then once the story starts and he starts getting into his own interpretation and dissection of the play or the opera, uh, that's when you start reading the comic. And uh, I, I assure you that it will take your, the pleasure that you get from this to an entirely uh, new level. Um, he'll, he'll kind of do what Manly P. Hall did. He will, you know, take this this basic narrative that you're, pre well, it's not very basic, but he'll, he'll take this narrative and he'll unravel it for you and he'll just show you kind of what's inside. And it, it's astounding how much is, is within this stuff. And he, he really just heightens the whole thing. And I know this sounds like a lot of work, you know, um, you know, I, I, I just want to read a comic book. Why do I have to spend hours doing work beforehand before I even get into this book. If it was a successful comic, couldn't I just pick it up and run with it? Well, you can, and yeah, you'd enjoy it, but the thing is, for for those who have the patience and who put in the work will get so much more out of this than those who don't. You will honestly have a completely different experience if you have this sort of understanding behind you before you get into it. Otherwise, if, if you took two people, um, one person who just uh, picked it up and ran with it and had no kind of uh, background uh, understanding and another person who did, they would, and you asked them both about it, they would honestly, they, they would both be describing two completely different books. They would have two completely different experiences and that's why it's kind of necessary. So anyway, uh, what is the Ring of the Nibelung even about? <laughs> well, if you watched, say, Lord of the Rings or read Lord of the Rings, uh, you know, that, that's something that was very much inspired by Norse myth. You know, there's a cursed ring, uh, which is held by a dwarf, Albrecht, who obtains the ring after renouncing love. And on the surface, it's about a cursed ring. And there's Odin and Valkyries and dragons and broken magical swords and destiny and lust and betrayal and the struggle between the mind and the heart. And yeah, so what's it about? Uh, everything. <laughs> it's about everything. Um, yeah, it's incredibly dense. It's literally about everything. It's like a compressed, it, it's, you take a bunch of coal and you compress it and then there's a diamond inside with just, it, it's everything. Um, that's why you need to arm yourself before you get into it, because it's, it's so loaded. Um, now, the, the really cool thing about this is the fact that it's a comic. And you're thinking, you know, how, do you, how does one take a 15-hour opera and then go, oh, yeah, I'll turn it into a comic book? I mean, it's an opera. It's, like a, it's music and actors on a stage. And how do you, what? That doesn't seem like it would work. But... P. Craig Russell, 
he's the man he's awesome he can pull it off you know uh for example one of the things that wagner uses in his opera is this thing called uh light motifs uh these are kind of i don't know what the language is exactly but it's these are musical notes or or tones that are associated with the characters like think of uh jaws you know the dun 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 when you hear that you know that jaws is coming right or darth vader with that imperial march the what is it like dun 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 then that's that's darth vader's that's his thing um they have kind of music to accompany the characters and this is sort of I think it's a Wagner invention. I think he kind of came up with this stuff. And so what he would do is he would incorporate these light motifs with his characters in the opera, and they would kind of come in and come out and go over top of each other, and they would create harmonies and tensions and so on. Just really brilliant, uh, overlapping, kind of a way to communicate so much without saying anything at all, just in these uh, dissonant notes that would be created. It just really, really interesting. But uh, in the comic, how do you how do you do something like that? And it's interesting because he uses panels and spacing and composition and all these other kind of elements that are unique to comics to kind of create the same effect. So he's sort of taking this thing that's very unique to this this. Wagnerian thing, and then he's he's like, okay, well, I'll just take that and I will adapt it to something that is very unique to this medium. So you have these two very unique mediums that are that are somehow all of a sudden complementary, and it's really interesting, and it works very very well. It works really well, and he does it really successfully, and uh, that that's one of the most interesting things about this. And I, as somebody who you know, makes comics and is interested in storytelling and all of that, that would be the, one of the most difficult things is, you know, how do you, you're missing out on this, you know, probably the most important tool, which is the music. You know, how do you take a musical into a world of silence? And how do you take a musical that has actors and all of this stuff and, and the use of uh, time you know, music is based on time, and how do you take that and then you move it into a medium where there's literally no time? Fascinating. R really interesting to see uh, what he does with this. And, uh, and it's successful. He does a really great job. Um, his illustrations are, are beautiful. He, he's a, a great illustrator. Um, you know, they're just, they're top notch. Uh, the coloring is quite nice too. If I had any gripes about this book, which I really don't, uh, it would be that I, I wish that the colorist had more time to uh, spend on coloring and that they could have done something. I wish that they had the time. And this isn't actually me putting a negative thing on the, on the colorist because they did a great job. The, the tones and the color choices are, are bang on. I, I just wish they had more time. And I'm sure that that's like everything though, you know, you wish you had more time to work on it. But it's a 400 page book. So there's only so much time you can spend on each page. And the result is that the coloring is a little bit less organic looking than I would have liked. But man, that is such a minor thing. It doesn't, it doesn't drag down the, the quality of the book at all. Um, the one thing that I really wanted to comment on is the lettering. And it's not very often that lettering stands out, except when it's done terribly. And lettering is a lost art these days. Um, it, it's just, it seems like people are forgetting about the fact that lettering is a thing. It, it's a skill, it's a, an art form in itself in a way. And uh, it can kill a book, bad lettering. Bad lettering can kill your book. One one thing that people really need to realize, it's like, look at your lettering. It is It just, if it's bad, it's an instant turn off and can sink a book. But in, in this book, in, in the lettering is so, it's so well done. It is so good. It's some of the best lettering, honestly, that I have ever seen. It's, there's such a musicality to it that you really get the feeling that these people are singing. And, and there's so much emotionality and it, oh, it's just great. It just twirls and floats and spins and, and, and it, it, it feels ethereal. Oh, it's, it's so hard to explain, but it, it's so well done. And 
And part of it is what's within the letters, you know, the, the writing itself, the translation itself, is it's, it's great. It works really well, and it's not dumbed down in any way. It's, uh, it's a straight ahead, you know, here it is, deal with it kind of translation, and uh, it's great. So mixed in with this strange, this strange art and the strange lettering and the, the, not, not the strange art, but the strange, uh, the setting feels so otherworldly and, and like you're in a timeless space, which is exactly what you want in something like this. You can't really pinpoint where this is happening, when this is happening, and that in itself is genius because it, it just has a, a feeling of um, timelessness, which is such an amazing thing to create in a work of art. You know, creating something that just feels timeless, that it's existing uh, in the past and the future, all, all spaces at once. It's like Star Wars. It's one of the, um, the brilliant things just saying a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. That is such a brilliant thing to do because it takes something that you think is going to be futuristic, but you're putting it in the past and you're creating kind of a, uh, uh, a bit of a funk in the brain because you don't know where to place it exactly. And uh, here in, in this book, it's that same thing. And even the grounding for locations, everything feels like, like you're just on the edge of the material world because you are. This is a world of, of gods and they are on the edge of the material world and you feel it and it's it's so it's so well done so uh, yeah i mean he just uh yeah i i, I hope people can appreciate <laughs> how how difficult creating these things creating uh I, I guess these sensations are and and you have to kind of open yourself up to be sensitive to it which is why i recommend all of this backup material because it will really enrich um your enjoyment of it now, uh, yeah, otherwise, it's kind of like talking about sex with a virgin, you know? Like, there, it's just kind of like, huh? You know? <laughs> so, anyway, I think that just about wraps it up. Uh, yeah, what can I say? I highly recommend it, obviously. And, um, yeah, there's good comics out there. There's a lot of them. Go buy them.